Some of the sweetest voices I have heard lately came from two of our community members. Their passion, purpose, and cause were music to my ears. Tonight, they will use the strength of their voice to speak for a species that is unable to speak for themselves. Please welcome to the stage, Finn and Chloe. Hi, I'm Finn, and that's my sister Chloe up on the slide. Hi, Chloe. Hi, Finn. And together, we started Project Howl. Help our wolves live. I want to tell you a story about a wolf we met. We live on a farm in Souk. When we moved here, we learned that there are nine wolf packs in the Souk Hills. On a full moon, we have heard them howling. So two years ago, one May morning, I woke up to see a wolf sitting on a mound behind our house. He was looking out over the field like the lord of the land. The sun lit up his mane like it was on fire, and his head was huge. He knew we were watching him, but he stayed for quite a while anyway. And when he did get up to go, he walked away slowly, like he had all the time in the world. We had so many questions. Was he a lone wolf? Or was he exploring on behalf of his pack? Was he a she with a den full of pups somewhere? Why was he here, so out in the open? We knew that wolves were clever. They knew that he Humans were dangerous to them and were always careful to avoid us. So why was he here? Was he really here to eat us, like in the fairy tales? Or did he want to share something important, like that he's a Vancouver Island wolf, a distinct species, genetically different, that they're of the forest and of the sea? and that they need access to both. Or perhaps he saw the environmental damage we were causing, and he came to talk, to say that wolves could help, because they're good at that sort of thing, if we let them, and they do it for free, if we let them. They did it in Yellowstone National Park, and it happened on our farm, too. In the early 1900s, Yellowstone wanted to attract more tourists. The tourists wanted to see more big herbivores. But the wolves were scattering the herbivores into the woods. So the park decided to kill the wolves. The last wolf was shot in 1926. With the wolves gone, the big herbivores came out into the open and their populations exploded. The plan worked brilliantly and the tourists were thrilled. But not everything went according to plan. It never does. You see, the herbivores ate through everything and pretty soon, the parkland was devastated, because here's what happened. When the grass was gone, they went for the bushes and small trees. With the bushes and small trees gone, the songbirds and the beavers had to leave. The small rodents had no more protective habitat, so they had to go. And with them went the birds of prey. With no more shade along the riverbanks, the river water warmed, the salmon stopped coming, and the bears had to go elsewhere to find their dinner. When the winter rains came, the bare riverbanks began to erode. 
the rivers widened, flooding the lowlands, and the park fell apart. Brilliant plan. It took the park 70 years to figure out that wolves were the one who ran the whole show. That wolves were the one who was the keystone species. And if removed, everything fell down. <clears throat> so, in 1996, wolves were reintroduced back into Yellowstone National Park. The results were astonishing. With the wolves back, the big herbivores scattered and hid. And just one year later, the grass, bushes, and small trees were regrowing. And six years later, the rivers, the rivers had narrowed, the lowlands had drained, and everyone had, had come back. The ecosystem had regenerated, and it was all because of the wolves. We saw a similar thing happen on our farm when the wolf arrived. Like so many farms, we had a big problem with Canada geese landing in our field and eating all our crops. We chased them. Dogs chased them. But nothing we tried worked. They wouldn't leave. And then, as soon as the wolf showed up, they took off, literally overnight. And they didn't come back. Our seedlings took hold and grew. But that's not all with the arrival of the wolf we began to see changes coming to the landscape. The deer scattered. Alders grew up around the pond. A beaver came to the creek. He built a lodge and a dam and made a deep pond, which calmed the storm water, and the flooding in the field actually lessened. We could see balance returning to the land. But here's the thing. Despite the wolf's importance, in, Ca in Canada, it is very legal to kill a wolf. In fact, it's encouraged. <clears throat> Just last month, the BC government called for increases to the wolf kill. Based on opinions, that, near, that deer and caribou numbers are down because there are too many wolves eating them, based on, opi on opinion, not scientific data. Yes, it's true that deer and caribou populations are in decline in BC. And yes, it's true the herds are not in good shape. But it's not because of the wolves. What would our wolf say about this? It's not us, it's you. He would explain that wolves don't compromise their food source by overhunting to extinction. He would explain that they only ever have one breeding pair per pack so their numbers stay steady. He would explain, if food is scarce that year, they don't have pups at all. That's science, not opinions. He would also explain that his food source, the deer and the elk and the caribou, need big, open, rich landscapes habitats to sleep in and to breed in and to eat in. And that habitat is getting attacked and destroyed all over the place by humans, not by wolves. 
in so many different ways. By clear cutting, logging, mining, drilling, fracking, damming, pi pi piping, and urbanizing. The wolf repeats. It's not us, it's you. But instead of listening and taking responsibility, we blame the wolves and then we kill them. And then the wolf says louder this time. We wolves don't understand. We haven't seen that wolf since that time two years ago. But we see his signs, his scat, and his tracks in the patches of mud after the rains. Others in Souk saw him too. Our friend Gary took these pictures down at the Souk River. And another friend saw a wolf on Ella Beach. And just weeks ago, three wolves were seen running down Phillips Road. Was one of these wolves our visitor? Had he started a new pack? Pack number ten. <laughs> that would be so great. We started Project Howl to ask people, to help our wolves live. We've been researching a lot and learning about wolves, using trail cameras to collect data from the Damamu Creek Wildlife Corridor. We've also been writing letters and emails to MPs and MLAs and newspapers and talking to people like you every chance we get. So here we are now, asking you to ha ha <coughs> help our wolves live. Pl <coughs> Please tell the BC government to stop the wolf kill. Sign petitions, write letters, send emails, and learn more about wolves. Please sign our petition out in the lobby, along with the letter going to the BC government. And protect, pr protect our wild spaces and defend them when they are threatened. And support the wildlife scientists and conservation groups who work so hard to protect <coughs> the oceans and the forests and the rivers and the creeks. Run with the wolves and come howl with us. Thank you. Okay. Finn, Finn, come here. Come and see your audience. Take a bow. Good for you. <laughs> Come on down, Chloe. And here's Chloe. Take another bow, you two. For the wolves. <laughs>